And... I think we're here. I think we're live. Sweet. Welcome to Facebook. Yeah. And the, uh, what are we now? The Living NLP Podcast. That's right. We were the No BS NLP yeah. Podcast, which was no belief system, which mm-hmm. is something we're always going to talk about anyways, as we yeah. live NLP yeah. with flexible belief systems. And I'll just throw in a little Robert Anton Wilson drop right there, because that's who, one of the main people who taught me how to be flexible with your belief system so that it didn't turn into rigid BS, which was the other kind of BS. Yep. We were just having a lovely conversation about Robert Anton Wilson, otherwise known as Raw. Raw. And uh, we were suggesting maybe we should have an entire episode dedicated to him at some point. And maybe I, a whole, a whole I think podcast, that would be fun. Quite honestly, like a whole podcast. Like an entire yeah. separate podcast? Yeah. Like the Raw, yeah. Raw cast or something like that. Dude. Raw cast. Yeah. It's our, it's our Although, in, in a sense, that's what this is. I know, I think. it's like, I know. But even, yeah, I, I get it. We, like, we might run out of shit, but it is what it is. Yeah. Okay. For it's NLP like geeks that. that are hanging around, Robert Anton Wilson and Richard Bandler were uh, at least more than acquaintances. I don't know if I'd call them friends, but they, they certainly rubbed elbows and yeah. were running in many of the they same about circles. Information so. and flexibility and mm-hmm. meaning and how words create reality and we each have our own version of reality just like we each have our own version of the meaning of words Mm -hmm. and uh so yeah even like 1995 was when i just found a a cosmic trigger which is one of his uh main books is that the first one you read that's the that's one of the first ones i read too uh, um there's a book silly hippie hippie weird thing called uh where are you where are you oh my god here it is so in 93 or whatever, there's this book called Nothing in This Book is True, but it's exactly how things are. And it's about <laughs> weird stuff and sacred geometry and like, oh, it's cool, like aliens and whatever, but just, you know, uh, but in on the back, it said, because I, I thought it was interesting as a trippy person. And it says, nothing has the potential to become cosmic trigger of the 90s like this. And I was like, well, it says, Cosmic Trigger, Robert Anton Wilson's 1977 psychedelic mind bender. And I was like, mm. what's that? At which point <laughs> I found Robert Anton Wilson's Cosmic Trigger. And then the, one of the great things about him is he was such a synergist. Speaking of, he turned me on to Buckminster Fuller, uh, mm. you know, Alan Watts, Timothy Leary, NLP, John Lilly, just like, like so much of all the things that I love, you could just follow one of his books to the next book, yeah. to the thing, to every, yeah. he'll, he'll reference a name. I'm like, down that rabbit hole, down that rabbit hole. So anyways, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make, they're all somewhat the rod cast. Um, I found uh, Robert Anton Wilson because I read, uh, I was studying Wilhelm Reich first. Huh. Exactly. And then Reich um, has a book, uh, or no, no. Um, Robert Anton Wilson wrote a play called yeah. Wilhelm Reich in Hell, yep. and I uh, got that. Uh, I never saw a, a play version. I don't think many people put on the play yep. too frequently. But I got the book of it and read it, and was like, "Who the fuck is this guy?" And then I think the other time I heard from him was I was uh, studying Moshe Feldenkrais, and. Oh, oh, um, nice. What? Feldenkrais? Feldenkrais? Did I say it wrong? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and Robert Anton Wilson and he were also connected. And uh, so it was Richard Bandler and Feldenkrais. Because right. Feldenkrais. it's a mind, body, all that stuff. And then exactly. it, it, it had such an impact on me. So, and let it, yeah. if you are listening or watching or like, who's where, where do you recommend? What, what's the best place to start uh, you know, for Raw? Cosmic Trigger. I mean, it's, it's or, um, I mean, it depends what you're into. For NLP people, the New Inquisition is a big one because Korzybski. He talks, that's, I think he created, uh, it, it, he was, that's the book where he talks about E prime, which is like yeah. English where you don't use the verb be or is. Yeah. Because all of those are false. N- zero right? identity statement. Right. So no, like, I am. <laughs> right. To, to, to be, to say that is something is not true. But if you say that appears this way to me, mm-hmm. that is a true-ish. It's a more true statement than to say that is that that 
You know what I mean? One of the top, one of the top experts on NLP, uh, Michael Hall in Australia, he wrote several books in E prime Mm. because he was just trying it as an exercise. They're not very easy to read admittedly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think he re-released them later. Uh, but even timelines, I think, which is the other than timeline therapy and the basis of personality, Adventures right. on Timelines or something like that is was right. originally written so in E-Prime. I have used, well, I don't speak in E-Prime. I have used, appears to me, like if you say to someone, you are a jerk. Right. You are doing things bad. Yeah. Or like if, like I say, it's like couples or if someone's having a problem with their other right. spouse. Rather than go, you make me feel bad. I, I, I don't like... Or like you make me feel bad. You go, the way you're behaving. Yes. Uh, is, uh, uh, I've, I am reacting in this way. As, as opposed yeah. to saying, you are doing this, you take responsibility. And mm-hmm. then you say, I go, you know, it appears to me that you are doing something that is yeah. not right. I try to teach to this. A judgment statement. You say, I'm talking about what I can talk about. I'm saying, well, you know, this is how it seems to me. I'm yeah. speaking about my experience. Therefore, it's true. But when you say you're crazy, mm-hmm. it's different than um, it seems to me like there's something going on with you, right? Yeah, I, I try to teach this to my 10 year old in terms of like opinions about movies and stuff like that movie is crap. Right. Instead of that, like, right. no, I didn't enjoy that movie. Right. Like to me, right. my experience of that movie is exactly. that it was crap. And that's true for him. But <laughs> exactly. It's crap is not that's a blanket statement that is attempting to apply it to everyone as a factual at, statement at which point it loses its power because you can say um you know i yeah, exactly i i didn't care for that movie is different than saying that movie is wor- not worth caring about and it's a meta model violation too so yeah. <laughs> it's all connected so you you said uh if you're gonna for those oh, who are uh, still well, listening after this bunny trail well, if you're, you, uh, you should be <laughs> uh, you know it's like Cosmic Triggers is classic one, 70s psychedelic mind bender. Um, and he really learned a lot about his stuff that like, I was learning this in the 90s, but like all the crazy stuff in the 60s and the 70s and yeah. all, you know, it's like, there was a lot going on back then. Um, that's a good one. Or the new Inquisition is the one I think that's more okay. about language and uh. um, how language is so powerful. And, you know, yeah. that's the first place I ever heard uh, the map is not the territory. Oh, all right. Right. Um, yeah, NLP didn't come up with that, folks. <laughs> right, because Korzybski said it, and that's the first time I heard it there. And then, of course, Alan Watts. I think it was Gregory Bateson, actually. Ah, there, there you go. Bateson did it first. Perfect. Yeah. But I do love the menus, not the mail. Yes, exactly. Good. All right. Well, okay, so uh, we'll, hey, we'll, welcome uh, to the podcast. For- <laughs> <laughs> so let's, uh, how's your week been? Good, good. I, uh, I've got an anecdote that was uh, too, like, Two people said the same thing to me again. Like, you know, it's that sort of theme-ish thing. Like, I was like, what was I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? And then someone else said the same. I was like, oh, cool. I'm there it go. is. Yeah. All right. You want to go first? Sure. Um, so I have a client who has done very well with stuff. He's different than he was when we started after his breakthrough, etc. And he was talking about uh, you know, he wants to take his business to the next level. And I'm asking him, like, who do you model around that? Who's okay. So who is someone that you have seen who has done what you want to do? And then we'll, we'll model. Him. Um, and he says, well, there's this one woman, she had a, she was working at a co-loft, then she had a partner, you know, an assistant, then she had to move to a, a building, then she had to move to a warehouse because her whole thing, rah, rah, rah. and he's like, man, I just, back in the day, I couldn't even imagine having a business like that, that was that successful. And I was like, well, what about now? And he goes, I can imagine it now. <laughs> I was like, yes, you can, can't you? And, and then uh, I had another client who said the same thing to me where it was like before she couldn't imagine it, but now she can imagine her because her business is taking off. She's got all the good problems of like, oh my God, like people are calling me and things are happening. And it's like, and, and it's like, this is, I, you know, I hadn't even, I didn't imagine it was going to be like this. I'm like, but she goes, but now I can't imagine it's like this. I can use my imagination. 
I'm free to use my imagination however I want because it's not just in the dark place. Because so many people just, they're so good at using their imagination to think about all the terrible things. We talk about catastrophizing and all that stuff. Like, yeah. Oh, I'm just going to, eh, the judgment everyone's going to send me. Oh, I'm just going to, that's imagination. Or you can use your imagination to imagine whatever, whatever the mm -hmm. heck you want to do, whatever. Maybe it's crazy. Maybe it doesn't make any sense. Hooray for you. Let it feel good. Or actually imagine, oh, you know, I can imagine myself having a business that's successful or going forward and helping people or whatever it was. So it was just nice that two people said to me that they had essentially taken back the reins of Ooh. their imagination and they were able to use it because i mean essentially what is hypnosis if not uh intentional imagination or or intentional and unintentional imagination right guided you know what i mean so yeah. that was that was a nice um nice little sort of tie in and it sort of goes it helped me realize oh yeah that's kind of basically what using imagination helping people to take back their imagination so they can use their imagination again and give them the key Essentially, yeah. right? so. Part of the problem with that word imagination is people tend to think of it in a very reductionist way. They tend to think of that word as just imagination or pr just pretend. Mm -hmm. But the, the problem is people don't realize how much of your experience moment to moment is already imaginary, yeah. that right. you're living in the matrix. It's right. just That's the matrix being constructed by your own your, your mind. <laughs> reality tunnel, sorry. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> back to raw. Your but, um, internal representation right. of reality. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're, yeah. So it's thought uh, and all that stuff. And it's all imagination. Yesterday for Valentine's Day, which is also my wife's <clears throat> birthday, which is why we're doing the podcast here on Saturday. We watched, uh, my wife and I, one of our favorite movies of all time, which I think she's probably watched like 15 times. I probably watched it 10 times, maybe. Um, uh, it's called Cloud Atlas. Um, by the Wachowskis, uh, the people who made the matrix. And, uh, there's a line in that that popped into my head when you started saying this, like, I can't imagine it now I can. There's a line in it. I'm going to butcher this, but it's something to the effect of, um, all limitations are illusion or all boundaries are illusions and all conventions can be transcended. And in order to transcend a convention, the only thing the first step is to conceive of transcending it, that you have to be able to imagine right. being outside of that box. Right. And that's the only thing that happened, that the first step to being able to get outside the box is to imagine that it's possible to get outside that box. Right. And that to me is such a, we talked quite a bit about psychedelics in our last one. That's a very psychedelic thought to me is yeah. that you are in the boundaries of something and you don't even see it. You don't, you're, you, it is the water the fish swims in. And then the walls come tumbling down, which is a Robert Anton Wilson book uh, <laughs> about a guy doing the same thing. I think it was actually a, a play that he wrote as well. Um, yeah, and you think about I trust that the listener's unconscious is taking the suggestion that maybe oh. if you're interested in hypnosis and NLP, you should probably check and, out Robert and Anton Wilson. Development and just being open to information yeah. because, I mean, I was doing this years ago where it's like, watch news that you don't agree with. Yes. Like, because today we're in the world of yeah. I watch MSNBC and everyone else is a Nazi. And then people watch, well, I watch uh, fucking Fox News. And I'm a communist, else is a lip card, <laughs> commie, yeah. whatever. And no one has any idea that like there's a middle ground or whatever. But if you, yeah. actually, even if it's just to know what they're talking about, so you know more about the people you disagree with. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to be open to ideas and read it. I mean, back then, yeah. read a newspaper that you wouldn't read or read a yeah. magazine about something that you, that you have no interest in or just to yeah. kind of see what's, what's around and be open to information. I mean, not to go on a, on a political tangent here and, uh, I, I one of the ones that I think is so interesting is how many people hate Donald Trump and have never listened to a single speech that he's actually given. They've only heard uh, right. tiny little snippets and quotes that make him out to right. look like more of a moron um, than he, he really is. actually is. Yeah. Um, and uh, like one of my favorite like get uh, like fuck with your reality tunnel is. Um, uh, what is Scott Adams? Is that the Dilbert guy? Do you know who that is? 
Uh-huh. You should check this out. So I think his name is Scott Adams. He has a podcast and he is, it's kind of hard to pin him down on whether he's actually a Trump supporter or if he is just somebody who sees the insanity that the that he calls it the Trump distortion field or something like this or right. Trump derangement yeah, syndrome. syndrome yeah. And li- listen, I think Trump is not only... Uh, I'm not sure how much of an idiot he is, but I will absolutely grant you that he is as close to evil as I've ever thought of. Uh, he's, he's definitely a significant amount of both of those things. Yes. So that, that being said, I find listening to this guy talk about how he's not as bad as the left thinks. Which is also true. Fascinating. Because yeah. it genuinely yeah. triggers me well, that I'm like... Idiot. Yeah. Oh, I have swallowed this pill. Yeah, exactly. Of echo like, chamber. he's That's Hitler. A, yeah. yeah. And everybody's in their echo chamber, which is another word for like a really rigid, tiny little, uh, you know, right. reality right. tunnel. Right. We're going to connect our little reality tunnels. We're never going to get out of it. it. And everyone else, everyone who does it, you know, that, that, that meme, I don't know if you've seen it. It's like Hitler writing a rainbow and it says everything I need to know about, you know, internet discourse. And it says anyone who doesn't, anyone who disagrees with me is Hitler kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, yep. You know, there's got to be a middle ground. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, and anyways, all of that is imagination. Oh, and yes. one, one more thing, just a side imagination thing. So I, have, I had a sort of a, a little taster that I did, like a, like a, a first little meeting with someone online to see what, you know, what's what. And I gave them a little 20 minute hypnotic gift. I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's just, we're gonna make something good better. And so you can see the power of your mind. And so I'm like, what do you do? She's like, oh, I'm an actress. I'm like, great. Have you ever experienced hypnosis? Eh, not really. Okay, well, here's the thing. I'm going to ask you to use your imagination, and I'm going to ask you to follow direction. Do you think you can do that? She's like, yes. I go, exactly. And so then we did a thing, and she was a little conscious about it. We took her back to a, a moment that felt really good for her in the flow. Then I go, okay, so you know, what, what, do you, what can you take from this? What's a symbol of this? And she's like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm kind of stuck. And I go, well, what's what's there now and she goes well there's there's this necklace that i was wearing that i had talked to before i went in and i'm like really i go she talked to the necklace necklace it was something she yeah, and I go, that, that's not that, hypnosis <laughs> so at that point i went that necklace take and that, <laughs> as soon as i got in that little crevice i was like now now, now you you can feel the necklace can't you she's like yeah, yeah. You know, even though the necklace isn't there is it no is it? but you can feel it can't you yes i can and what does that necklace have to say to you now? Yes. And they're like, and this is your imagination. And it's just like, yeah. it's great. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, oh, if I listen to the necklace that's not here, they go, right. And it's always not there. And yet it's always talking to you, isn't it? She's like, yes. So more imagination. It's all just imagination. So. This is why I love this, this podcast and connecting and talking like this every week is that there's these moments where like you bring up that thing about the necklace and you say she was talking to the necklace and like the hair on the back of my neck stands up. Like, I'm like, there it is. That's the right. door. That's the right. opening. As soon as I went, there. I like, oh, and like, <laughs> is that resistance? Because watch this. <laughs> right, yes. right in. And she's like. It's so, it? it's. You got to tap into their imagination. Then it says like hypnosis, right? Critical yeah. mind out of the way because your critical mind was like, oh no, there's no message. I'm no, who am I talking to? But there was that one time I was talking to a necklace. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love it, the experience of just sharing these stories back and forth so that people listening are like, what, what does that crack look like? Like when you're talking to somebody and they've got their walls up and you're, you're feeling around trying to find the crack, what does it look like? And it, to me, it's more of a feeling. It's more of a kinesthetic that when you get on it, you're like, that's it. That's the thing. Right. But I love that as soon as you said that, I'm like, yep. <laughs> And then it was in, and it's like she's wearing the necklace now. She's playing yep. it and doing it and, and learning from the necklace that wasn't even there. And yeah. He, so, but anyways, it's imagination. Okay. Oh, okay. My one more question, like, oh, yeah. What, what can't you imagine? Imagine what you can't imagine. Like when someone says, "I can't imagine that," what, is, what does that even like? What I mean, it's very quantum linguistic, mind bending language sort of thing. Like, what can't you imagine? What is unimaginable, yeah. really? Yeah, I I often like to point out that uh, we are not certain that the universe is infinite, but we are absolutely certain that the human unconscious imagination 
is infinite because you can imagine infinity and then you can double it. Yeah, and what's nuts <laughs> is that like all that happens in this squishy bunch of goop. Yeah, <laughs> right uh, here. So, yep. All right, a bunch of fatty jello right in there. Okay, so uh, f- confession: I- I'm gonna cheat a little bit because yeah, my anic. My, and I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe my anecdote and my quote are connected. So I'm going to, I'm going to go right from my anecdote into okay. my quote. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> so my anecdote is yeah. Oh, yeah, I, uh, I was working with a client who I've been working with for uh, probably a year now. I have a lot of clients who, once they kind of get in a groove, we're just constantly going from one project to the next project and we're we're in this uh, i took a program with a guy named evan pagan a while ago called um it was a, a coaching certification program called level up and it was basically the idea that once you get a client if you're doing good work with them they should never stop coaching with you that you can continually be challenging them to grow and and t- tackle something new and go deeper and k- what do you need to level up? What's the next level? There is no end to that growth. They might outgrow you and then they need to go find a new coach, but they should never outgrow coaching once they get the hang of it. So I have a lot of clients who've worked with me for years at this point. So this guy, uh, we've been working on purpose for a while. We've been working on trying to find his mission And we did a breakthrough session on it and we kind of opened the door to like him first starting to like embrace the idea of what it might be. And then he kind of stagnated for a while. He was busy in his work. We were working on a bunch of other stuff. He lost like 35 pounds, um, started exercising. Uh, We're working on some other ideas, but he wasn't grabbing on to the idea that we had for his purpose and his mission. And then he got laid off from his job. And this was in like December. And in the month of January, he was like spinning his wheels. And we were talking about good stuff and he was working on a project. He's he got this truck that he's fixing up uh, and he was working on it, getting ready to resell it and like making it look beautiful, like wood steering wheel and all this kind of cool shit. It's like a classic truck. And, uh, and, and I just noticed that every week he was kind of coming in and being like, I don't know what to talk about. And so this last time he said, I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. And I heard it and I'm like, all right, I'm going to hear that as a cry for help. So I then kicked him in the ass in that session. Like I lit a fire and was like, all right, man, what are you going to commit to doing this week? And I, uh, this is one of my tactics that I use a lot is chunk it down into action steps. What work are you getting them to do? That's not just hypnosis. It's okay. We did the hypnosis. Oh, yeah. What are you going to do? Make your imagination real. Yes. Yes. And, and it doesn't get real till the rubber meets the road. The yeah. rubber meets the road in your actions. So I had him pick like three things that he was going to do that week. Maybe it's four things. I, I try to keep the list short, but they need to be like high leverage activities. So if you get this done, it's going to mean, and and there's a magical question. What would you need to get done this week that would make it feel like this week was a success? You can ask that same question for a day. What do you need to get done today that will make this day feel like a success? Good question. So, so I had him come up with this list and, uh, and he's supposed to send me his report that day. I didn't hear from him. I didn't hear from him till the next day. So I text him and I'm like, listen, dude, uh, I don't mean to be a dick here, and I do. What the fuck are you doing? Like, and I said it was pretty intense. Like, I got nervous. Like, I was like, I, like this is a client. He's been with me for a while. He's not making any money right now. He's paying me every month. Maybe he's gonna fire me. Maybe right. I'm gonna piss him off, and he's gonna be like, you know what? This isn't valuable. Fuck off. And like, I'm like, no. If he if he's paying me for anything, he is paying me to kick his ass in this moment right now. So I called him on his shit and I'm like, man, either do this or stop doing this work with me. Like you got to take this action right now. This is the moment when you get to decide whether this, whether you're going to spin your wheels or you're going to get moving. And, uh, and I'm like, if you've already done the things and you just haven't let me know, then ignore all this, please forgive me. (laughs) And he texted me like an hour later 
and he was like, you're absolutely right. Thank you for calling me on my bullshit. Here's my homework. And he sent it to me like done. And then I talked to him. We, we had a little bit longer than a week. So I talked to him seven days later and he sent me text message updates during that week that he's like, dude, things are feeling so much better. I got all these things done. It wasn't just the four things that we, he committed to. Everything started this upward trend. And then he got on the call with me and he's like, dude, I don't know what happened. And I'm sitting there like, <coughs> I do. <laughs> but he's like, everything shifted in the last week. He's like, I feel like now I'm not like looking for a job. I'm like, I'm going to go tell people they need to fucking hire me. And here's why. And like his energy completely changed. He had this idea of uh, working on the project that, that we've been talking about for his mission. I'm being vague because I don't want to reveal any specifics. Uh, but he was like, he had this idea of like, you need to write down a master plan because he was reading this book and it said like, write down a master plan. And he said he was immediately overwhelmed by that idea. But then he said, but I was like, yeah, but what if you did? What if you just wrote it down? And so he like stopped and wrote down seven steps and he was like, shit, that's it. That's my master plan. That's the next year of what I'm going to do. And he's like, I think I can do that. I can imagine that actually being real. It was like, it was like he got a shot of testosterone or something. It was like he all of a sudden was like this hungry, like instead of being the prey, he became the predator. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, like, he was like, no, I'm going to fucking make shit happen. And it happened because I, I was scared to call him on his shit. And I went, nope, nope, nope. I have to be willing to risk losing him as a client right now. Otherwise, I'm just a therapist. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I like do. I make the distinction between a therapist and a coach yeah. in that a therapist is going to sit there and talk to you about how you got here. And a coach is in my estimation, only interested in how you got here in as much as it's interfering with where you want to get to. So I have a quote that's related to this, but I'll pause right here before I transition. Do you have thoughts? <laughs> uh, yes. First of all, uh, the the power of metaphors idioms he said he's a car guy uh-huh and he told you he's spinning his wheels uh-huh <laughs> and then uh you told me that uh taking action is where the rubber meets the road yes <laughs> <laughs> and then when you get your wheels moving that's where you take action yep uh so that there's a lot of ways that you can also talk to people in terms of the metaphors they're using yes as well yep um, and i'm pretty sure i used all those terms with him i'm sure but i just like yeah. i hear all that and i'm like oh well what if you took that car that, that's spinning the wheels what if you got yes. bigger tires yeah what if you got some knobby tires what yeah. if you you know what if you got some you know so that put some uh, sandbags in the back of yeah, the truck <laughs> right whatever what do you need man so um and the other thing Along those lines is I, I, I've been a coach and I'm all about integrity as best as I can. I'm mostly about integrity. Um, and I show up when I'm supposed to show up. And when people don't show up or don't do the thing, it took me years to uh, not break, what is it, the second agreement of the four agreements? Like, don't take it personal. Mm. Me as the coach going, you fucking asshole. What are you doing? Like getting not yeah. even mad that they didn't do the thing they said they were going to do to me, but like you're fucking up your own. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. Why are you yeah. not doing the thing that like you committed to doing that you know is going to do? Yeah. So for me, it's a balance of uh, not taking it personally. Seriously, right. because people are, people come to me because they lack integrity in some way. Mm -hmm. And I work with a lot of people who are stressed out and afraid and whatever. And all those monsters come right up when they're, when it comes time, when a guy goes, Hey, I guarantee you can change. I guarantee it. And there's, if there's any kind of monsters are like, Rah! yes. They're like, okay, sure. That sounds great. Meanwhile, they're like, Rah, you don't never, you don't need him. You know? So I had to understand that that I bring this out in people, this, that moment, not even necessarily me, but the moment of being on the cusp of change brings that out in people. The, the flake monster is going to come and it's going to, and it's always, a, it's a, it's a 
clear symptom of the problem. And you'd be mm-hmm. like, yeah, that's because sometimes I'll flag. And I used to be like, dude, what the, because I mean, it's like if I'm making time for you on my schedule and you flag mm-hmm. on me, that's hard to not take personally mm-hmm. uh, on one level or another. But of course, don't take it personally because who knows? I think maybe 5% of them actually had a thing that was like an emergency. And I wrote to somebody like, dude, what the heck? he's like, you know, somebody wrote back, oh, my mom or whatever. And it's like, okay, maybe that's true. Either way, I shouldn't take it personally. So there's right. that, me not taking it personally. And then the other side is definitely not being afraid to make it personal. Well, my guess With is them. between the two of us is your, <clears throat> it's probably much easier for you than it is for me right. to hold them to that point and be like, I don't fucking care. I have a super easy time not taking it personally. Like you being like, it took you a long time. Like I'm like, I never, almost never, even when I should take it personally, I often don't. But if somebody that you have an appointment with, like to say that uh, you, you have a, a call for a consultation mm-hmm. and you've had a consultation, maybe it's time for the next one. And mm-hmm. they just don't show up. No word, nothing. You've, you've blocked out time in your schedule. You come home from a thing you could have been doing to be, yeah, I mean, I don't usually give people three strikes. Uh, it's usually yeah, yeah, yeah. one, two strikes oh, and you're sure. out. And pretty much. actually, yeah. we ended up appreciating that moment because it's such an easy way for me to go, see? Look yeah, what yeah, you just yeah. did. All I'm trying to do is help you. Look what you yeah. did for me. Is that a problem? Does that happen in your life? Is that something that's, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, everybody, oh, I feel like shit. And they do feel like shit. And usually, if you can, with rapport, et cetera, and not scare the hell out of them, which I've had to also tone down over the years, is you can use it as a perfect thing. <laughs> you don't like, say. Oh, oh, this is, this is, oh my God, this is exactly it. And it'll push them into my arms. Once yeah. you go, dude, you flaked, like I'm pointing out what you've just done to me, maybe in a way that a friend wouldn't or your family would be like, yeah. Now I can just be like, look what, look what you did. Is that who mm-hmm. you are? uh and call them on that so yeah don't take well, is- don't take it personal but also don't be afraid to make it personal yeah yeah That's well the- this is a perfect transition i think into oh. uh <laughs> into the the quote that i had so this is a quote from a book i think we've mentioned a couple times uh shout out jorgen rasmussen i might be pr- pronouncing that wrong but uh provocative hypnosis i would argue easily one of the best books written on NLP and hypnosis in the last, uh, well, when good. was this made? Like since the turn of the century, maybe like <laughs> when, when was this published? <laughs> uh, yeah, 2008. So in the, uh, the last 12 years, um, so good, worth your time, very much worth your time. Also the book that inspired this provocative therapy is one that I, I was quoting from recently. And I think that's probably when I mentioned this. But I like so, that book one of the, it's his real life adventures and, and yes. telling you real stories about stuff that happened as yeah. opposed to like just NLP is this. And if you do this, yeah. right, he does that. He's like, actually, and he, <laughs> I'm sure you're going to talk about, he was not afraid to uh, mess with people. Well, that's exactly uh, <laughs> the, the quote that, uh, that most impacted me. But one of the, one of the things he says early on in this book that I really appreciate is he said he wrote this book because he found that, many of the techniques and processes that he learned in the NLP trainings work very well in an NLP training. Um, And they work very well with a certain percentage of easy clients, let's say. But he wanted to find out how do you get results with what might people might label as a uh, resistant client or whatnot. Although Erickson would say there's no such thing as a resistant client, only inflexible communicators. Well, yeah. so you got to get fucking flexible, right? So this was the this was the section that probably impacted me the most when I first read it. Here's my quote. Many NLP practitioners limit themselves by defining rapport as a state where someone likes you, trusts you, and feels comfortable. I have had clients who liked and trusted me, but that I have had no rapport with. I have also had clients who hated my guts and still do, but with whom I had excellent rapport and quote, miraculous results. Many psychologists and researchers claim that the most important factor in therapy is that the client likes the therapist. The implication being that a warm and empathetic atmosphere where the therapist functions as some sort of midwife is essential. 
Well, I strongly disagree with this. It just doesn't match my experience. What you need is the ability to get the client to respond and you need superb calibration skills. Uh, so uh, the point here uh, that I think he says uh, slightly differently in another way, I'm going to paraphrase it is if you are afraid to that your client might not like you to let your client not like you there are going to be places you will not go and what's it, this is sort of a paradox because in my experience it's not that you need to go out of your way to make your clients not like you but if you're afraid to do something or say something because they might not like you then you are almost certainly going to be uh, working with your hands tied behind your back. You're not going to be able to get results with them past a certain point. And if their trauma, their uh, programming is deep enough, you're not going to be able to help them because you're afraid to say well, what might offend them or what might make them not like you. Well, that's, uh, that's why so many of these celebritoids, you know, make so many bad decisions you know, because they're all surrounded by yes men. Mm. people who are afraid to even question anything and then that's how those horrible movies get made that nobody wants to see or like decisions get made by people that aren't right or even i hate to bring it up again how you fly your helicopter into the fog because mm. no one said no yeah no right this is, you're being stupid yeah you know or to, to, to actually confront them and be, a, be not be afraid to tell them what they need to hear, yeah. which means maybe even making them feel a way that they don't want to feel so that you can actually help them heal. You know, th that makes me think of, I was, I was trying to think of, of a way to illustrate sort of the sociological mechanisms that cause this. And it made me think about, you know, those experiments that they do where somebody will be like waiting in a waiting room with, and everyone else in the waiting room is an actor, but they don't know it. And then at some point, one person will stand up for no reason and then sit back down and then two people will stand up and then sit back down and then three people and it'll happen like uh on or like there'll be a ding or a sound and then everyone will stand up and there's one person in the room who's not a part of this and at some point inevitably that person will start standing up with everyone else just because that's what we're all doing. And then they'll do the same, a similar one in a classroom situation where they'll be asking questions and they'll get, uh, everybody will be raising their hand and saying which one of these, and, and they'll say like, which one of these lines is longer than the other? And they'll, they'll, be, they'll be correct for like four or five in a row. And then one of them, everyone in the room except one person is an actor and they will all choose the wrong one. And that person will clearly be able to see that the, that line is not the longest one and everybody's pointing at that one. And, and almost 100% of the time, the people will go along with it. That would not be me. I don't actually doubt that. <laughs> I, would, I would be, I am dug into the, I see this. Now, while I appreciate that everyone has different realities. What, <laughs> what is wrong with friends, all you people? You're all fucking wrong. I, it seems to me that you're all fucking wrong. <laughs> uh, you know, so he, one, of the, one of the thoughts that I have, though, is I, knowing what we know about hypnosis, I would... I would bet that a significant number of people who are the one person, not the actor, I bet that a good percentage of those people will actually hallucinate that line as being. Or con confabulate whatever they need to exactly. confabulate. Exactly. Because they, cognitive dissonance says, well, I couldn't possibly be misperceiving it that badly. Isn't that religion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but to get, to, to get back to actors, what I love about homeboy uh jorgen rasmussen yeah he has a thing in his book or you fellow, fellow coaches might be interested in this if you're really able to deal with it if a client couldn't afford to work with him he would work with them oh, that's under right. the understanding that they someday would someday i'm gonna play, ask you for a favor they would actors <laughs> in a real world thing because he would take people out in the real world and he would heat all everybody's stuff up. And he, his whole point was to get them into the state yeah. of this problem so he could then work 
yeah. with that instead of all the other stuff. But I, I just bring up the concept of actors of like being in a situation and like creating a situation on purpose that would set off his his person's yeah. issue. You so just that- breezed by a super powerful point that one of the things that I took from that that I loved is he said the best context to work on a problem is or to fix a pattern is when it is occurring yeah. naturally right. in the happening. moment exactly not when they're t- in the office telling you about the problem right. the best place to do it is in the moment where you can see it come up and then interrupt the pattern and and right. rewire it right yeah. there so then he would say well then why don't we manufacture what right. uh, seems to the client to be a real right with a splash mob of, of your old that. clients that owe yeah. you money <laughs> yep <laughs> so uh all right nice. your turn for a quote uh so i just did a little random reach out in in my book book holder my book holder uh richard bandler's guide to transformations yeah uh, it's kind of greatest hits uh, I actually stuff. haven't read it because of that. I have it on my shelf, but I never. You know, it's, it's, it's good. It's got fun. It's yeah, there. It's got some good stuff. Yeah. It's kind of. It's like great. It's sort of a good yeah. little yeah. intro. Yeah, that's kind uh, of what I figured. So uh, last night, I was out with my mother for Valentine's Day. Aww, lady, that's very sweet. He's available. Uh, <laughs> and we're talking to the people next to us. And she says, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm a hypn- hypnotist, I'm a therapist. Oh, really, do you work with, so one thing, do you work with smokers? Yeah, sure. She, and she, it's the husband and wife. And she goes, oh man, we love smoking, but we're not smokers. I was like, huh? She, the, the total identity, like like disconnect. She's like, yeah, I mean, I, if you had a cigarette, I would smoke one right now, but I'm not a smoker. I was like, okay, well, you let me know when you're ready to huh. <laughs> change that. But, she goes, well, do you, what, what other stuff? She goes, do you work with kids? Because she has three kids. I was like, not really. I have once, but they have a real short attention span. Although they do live in trance and they do use their imagination very well. I don't work with kids, but I do work with inner children most of the time. I mean, I'm literally, figuratively working with inner children yes. a lot. And if you yeah. can bring that kid out, and then that's actually who I'm doing. Like once you bring the kid out who's usually hiding in some hole because they've been, you know, hi- hiding from whatever's going on. You bring the kid out, you reestablish trust, all the love, all the good stuff. Then they're out. And then they're the missing link to the go, go, do, do alpha, get things done. They need the kid to come out and like play with that. So that you yeah. can have that childish wonder while you're doing the go, go, do, do. And uh, I said, I work with a lot of inner children and that reminded me to look up this, or when I, when I read this quote, it reminded me of what I said last night about how I work with inner children. And it says, um, as you start to enter their world, you can influence them. This is just speaking of clients, like a coach to a client. As you start to enter their world, you can influence them deeply, even at the level of their early childhood cognitive structures. When you are able to do that, you can easily encourage and influence people to move beyond whatever their limitations happen to be. Right. And it's Mm -hmm. so straightforward. It's so like, duh to us. Right. But when you actually, and then, you know, cause everybody talks about inner child, it's limit inner child. It sounds corny and overused, but the fact of the matter is that's what it is. Absolutely. When you get down to the thing, when you enter their world, to, to the early childhood cognitive structures is what really yeah. like, like stuck me. It's like when you were a kid, you decided whatever you were, and and like you forgot that you decided that, and that became a belief about yourself, and then you forgot you believed that about yourself, and that became your identity. Mm-hmm. And now you don't even know how to get back to that kid who's locked in the box that says I'm no good with girls or I'm uh, not worth success or whatever. And when you follow all that stuff, whether it's by creating the because you uh, with the Rasmussen thing, it's like, oh, um, what is like I'm I, I lack confidence, right? Let's just say I lack confidence. And that's the problem. But if it goes all the way back to a kid thing, it's hard to just go, okay, well, let's go back to your kid thing. But when you bring it up in the moment, you can follow that. It's like almost like like the direct line back to the kid. Yeah. As opposed to all the other, like, oh, it's this and it's that. Like you can take that emotion that you were talking about that you can create 
right there when it's happening. And that is almost like the, the affect bridge, as they say. Yep. It goes, zip, you know, like the rainbow bridge, you just straight to Valhalla or wherever it is. And you're like, bam, right back to that kid. Then you can encourage, even says encourage them because it's like, I don't, I don't even have kids. I don't tell kids what to do, but I do encourage them to discover that kid and talk to it and let it talk to them like that necklace talked to that lady. Because again, it's imagination. It's yeah. It's happening in their head. So <laughs> it's just like that I don't work with kids. I do work with inner children though. Yeah. I think um, when I think about, he, he mentioned the thing about the midwife. There's a model of therapy of the therapist or the coach as a midwife in helping the client birth themselves. The model, I, fine, I get it. But the one that I tend to think of for myself the most, especially with long-term clients, is reparenting. Is that so much of what I end up doing is modeling for people what they should have got in their childhood, what they should have had in their parental figures. Right. Uh, and uh, that inner child thing you're talking about is connecting to them, figuring out what they didn't get right. and what they didn't have and what they got that they shouldn't have got. Right. And then counterbalancing that stuff, giving them what they didn't get and rebalancing being, and healing what they did your, get. Being the parent that you never had or never always yeah. wanted or whatever. And you, showing you know, them you, how to be that parent for themselves too. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Like the MER stuff, all that stuff going back in time and whether it's past lives, whatever. Uh, it's the same, it's the same vehicle, whether you stop at this life or the next life or whatever. Yeah. Uh, to go back and, um, really watch, to watch someone. I mean, it's been some of the most powerful things I've seen is to watch somebody talk to themselves as a child and mm. tell them everything they need to know. And I always say like, notice how proud they are of you or how grateful they are of you for coming all the way back and saving their life for coming all the way back in time to save their life so yeah. that now they can be proud and excited to be you now it's like yeah what's happening and yet it's like that those are the inner children and, and i love it it's, it's it make it tickles me and it was it was fun to say like no i don't work with children but i do work with the inner children um because that's that's where the juice is there's a song from a, a comedy rock band called Ninja Sex Party. Um, and they have a song called uh, Danny Don't You Know, where the whole premise of it is it starts off with him, with the main lead singer as a kid in school, getting picked on and being dorky. And then he comes back in time and sings this song to the kid about um, right. like everything that's going to happen in his life and how awesome. like I know things are tough now and it's oh, good. dude the, oh, the cool. first time I saw it it's funny but the first time I saw it like I cried like I was like holy shit this is NLP right. like it's absolutely timeline shit right. and it's yeah. you're healing through the experience of watching it it's very right. much that thing cool. of going back and talking to your child have you seen ninja bachelor party no what's that so ninja bachelor party so another great influence of mine St. Bill, a.k.a. Bill Hicks, uh, his first movie, him and his buddy made a, a, like a, and back then you had like VHS and stuff. Yeah. They made a, a, like a little short movie called Ninja Bachelor Party. And it's about this dude who like, uh, you know, he's getting beat up. It's like a classic like Karate Kid sort of things. Like he's getting yeah. beat up by the bad guys and then he has to go find a master and he has a, a visionary quest on Robitussin DM. <laughs> and they, and they do the, he's on the Tussin, man. And so he takes the Tussin and then he, and then he goes and fights so the, the bad guy and wins. But it's just, it's basically them like going all over. And it took them years to do. They just did it here. They did it there. It was one of those like passion projects. This is a Bill Hicks thing. I've never yeah. even heard of it. Well, it's, it's just the fight scenes are like, and then rolling around <laughs> on the grass. It's like just, it's, it's so stupid, but you might enjoy it. Ninja bachelor party. You can probably. Okay. All right. All right. It's classic. I want to, I want to keep up on my, uh, on my Hicks. <laughs> yeah. Hicks. And then if there's St. Bill and then uh, Pope Bob, just mm -hmm. wrap it right back around to Pope Bob mm -hmm. of uh, the church of the sub genius. So Ooh, much raw too. So. Yeah. But that's what I mean. Pope, uh, Pope Bob is raw. Right. Uh, and then of course there's Bob. Yeah. Bob. Yeah. All right. So questions? You want to do a couple? Oh, questions? that's right. I don't, I don't have any questions. Do you, do you questions? I have a couple. 
Cool. Uh, two, 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 two. Uh, okay. So, uh, what are the best ways to do self hypnosis? Uh, well, it was a very short question. Sure. Uh, well, the first thing that came to mind was uh, watch a movie. Mm. <laughs> Whatever movie that you want to mm-hmm. be enjoying. I know you have your podcast going on, but uh, your other podcast where you talk about how to trip out on movies correctly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than uh, the self, the, I mean, even Zazen, sort of no mind stuff. Yeah. Trying to do that. Even getting yourself a nice anchor. Because I think that's a, a real good way to, that's what I do with people. Uh, I anchored that girl to her necklace. It's not there. She had this wonderful mm-hmm. feeling. And I said, it's the necklace, isn't it? Touch the necklace. Boom, done. Oh, bam, done. Is that not self-hypnosis? I mean, obviously everything is self-hypnosis. But um, by giving someone an anchor or giving yourself an anchor or teaching someone to give themselves an anchor, um, so that even the word relax reminds you of that time you, uh, whatever. I did this, uh, I taught somebody this yesterday uh she wanted to sleep she'd wake up in the middle of the night and then couldn't get back to sleep and so i was like well how would you be if you could get back to sleep and she eh, I took it she's like a baby ba- ba- baby where oh it's at the beach you know just like sleeping like a baby Boom. cool so you could take yourself you could say the word baby and you're like this baby on this beach feeling this one. and she practically fell asleep there she wrote to me and said it worked i did the thing i, I something woke me up in the middle of the night I did baby, whatever, and went back to sleep. So nice. Isn't that an anchor, essentially? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's a pretty good uh, start of have an anchor. You said, you want to do. Yeah. So anchoring, you said watch a movie, um, juggling. <laughs> <laughs> so along the lines of watch a movie, uh, anything you do where you lose yourself in the experience. So watch a movie, listen to music. Like I've music never, is a trance or, if or you're letting it walk, impact you. A drive. Yeah, just like Juggling anything that gets you out of your head and into your body is a yeah. trance of some yeah. form. Yeah. Uh, I Actually, mean, I, yeah, an exercise to like a uh, high end where it's just like, there's times when I do self-hypnosis on myself. When I'm in it, when I'm in an extreme physical yeah usually running uh where i'm just like it's just left right left right but i'm pushing 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 and it's at that time where i'm like brain gone body on yeah i will say to myself you're an amazing hypnotist you can fix anything right find whatever the problem yes is. the self-hypnosis fast yeah you mark I mean? mark cunningham used to do it on uh roller coasters he would go and get on the in the front of a roller coaster and while he's going like he would do it on the ones where your hand your feet are dangling right. and it's like 60 miles an hour and while he's on the roller coaster he'd be screaming suggestions to himself right. out yeah. loud oh, that's a good one <laughs> do that um okay so let, let's let's chunk up here I, because i i tend to do this so what are the best ways to do self-hypnosis? So we got to break down that question. What do you mean by best? What do you mean by self-hypnosis? So trance is a, is a very vague word. Um, sometimes I like to use the term altered state just to express the idea that like there's kind of a baseline of what you're normally doing. Eat some mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I was going to say, if you want to go into a really powerful state of self-hypnosis, try some breath work. Look up yeah. holotropic breathing yeah. and yeah. try that. Like you want to fucking feel hypnosis. <laughs> yeah. Like do some self-hypnosis while you're going into that kind of altered state. But the truth is, it, it depends on what your intention is. So the, the, the avenue into the altered state should be motivated by what you're trying to do when you're there. Like one of my favorite trance inductions is very simply close your eyes, breathe in through your nose, breathe out through your mouth, Okay, now what I want you to do is pretend that you're leaning forward and breathe in as if you were smelling a rose. And let it impact you. Let it flow through your body. Feel the feelings as if you were smelling a a beautiful fragrant rose right yeah revivification you know or ever just 
activate your imagination. And, right. and remember, if you do this and you really want to feel it, don't go there like, look, look, like this is how not to do it. You breathe in, so like breathe in. Okay, now I'm pretending to smell a rose. Right. You know how it doesn't look any different? <laughs> That's a problem because if you were really smelling a rose, would you lean forward? What would, your, what would the muscles in your face right. do or the muscles around your eyes if you were, like look at, look at, the, look at the way that I'm doing it. Yeah, I am acting, yes? Yeah, well, but that's... physiology and internal representation and state are all intimately interconnected, right? Yeah. This is basic NLP shit. Right. So, so let your physiology move you in a direction. Right. All right, next. Okay, self-hypnosis. Uh, is there anything that hypnosis or NLP isn't good at helping? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Uh, isn't good at helping? I, I don't know. It's, it's not good at helping people not do good with NLP and hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I'm going to have to mind read a little bit to give an answer to this. Um, I would say that, it, first of all, NLP and hypnosis are... are uh, it, there's not like one field of NLP. There's not yeah, one well, person who teaches well, it. Well, it depends on your definition of hypnosis is and all that stuff. You know. Correct. Correct. So uh, as far as I would say that in my experience, the way that NLP is often taught sometimes is missing some important emphasis. And I don't think it's an inherent problem. It's, it's not inherent to the thinking and philosophy behind NLP. It has more to do with the people who teach it. Some people who teach it are missing bits of, of the experience and, and insight from their own experience, and therefore they don't emphasize it in NLP. But it's not incompatible with NLP. It actually makes NLP work a lot better. So one of the big things for me that I don't think is emphasized enough in NLP and hypnosis work is somatic psychology. So the idea that your whole body is your brain and that all neurotic trauma, uh, neuroticism, uh, limiting beliefs, whatever, at some level have their corollary in your body physically. And that if you don't get the transformation all the way down into a physiological shift, they haven't really transformed. Yeah. When you're I love just- my favorite is when it's like, uh... Like, oh, great, you know, whatever it was, release this or have a moment that. And like, okay, come out. I'm like, how are you doing? She's like, I, I feel taller. I feel, yes. I feel like my shoulders just dropped. Yes, like, yes, yes. There you go. And that's super convincer. And then you're good to go from there. Yeah. Uh, if you're just playing around with words, sometimes, yeah. and I say just intentionally there, you're effectively rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You're not really making the substantial change. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I guess uh, the other thing NLP and hypnosis aren't good for is doing any of that stuff with people who don't want to do it, aren't ready to do it. Yeah. It's like no one wants to be the, you know, oh, you know, like, okay, I get it. You took an NLP course kind of a thing. Right. Like, that's not good for, it's not just like, you know, they teach you can do anything with NLP. Yes. And right. Just because you can, doesn't mean you should. And just because you can, doesn't mean someone wants you to. Yeah. So uh, there, there's, you can use NLP and hypnosis to sort of get your way in there and build hypnotic rapport, but yeah. it's, it's not, it's not like you can just NLP somebody, yeah. to, you know, to do whatever it, it's, it really has, you're right. It has a lot to do with feelings Mm hmm. Yeah, it took me a long time to to formulate my view now that if a picture is worth a thousand words, f a feeling has to be worth a million or an infinite number of words. And in that sense, I have come to really view the kinesthetic modality as the ground level that yeah. like before we had language mm -hmm. and before maybe even before we could even make pictures in our minds, well, dude, we had we, feelings. Before we had mouth, before we had tongues, right. before we had words, before we had eyeballs, right. we had a membrane 
that and we would feel, feel things yeah, yeah. and move <laughs> toward like, things that felt that, good uh, and away from things that, that were toxic. Like brain. You know what I mean? It's exactly. like the first one is biological one. That's the right. feeling one. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like not your feelings, but like feeling. Yeah, not your literally kinesthetic. Feeling, but actually kinesthetic. Not your linguistic like, abstraction of those kinesthetic right, or your sensations. Emotion. It's not, yeah, it's not your, it's your feeling. It's your ability to feel something. Yeah, yeah. Then it's your feelings of emotions. Yeah, yeah. Then it's your word, your, your, the way you sort of, you know, gestalted those feelings into uh, anger. Yeah. There's, there it is. That was anger. But even before all that is the feeling. Yeah. And so many, so many people, I'm sure the people you work with too, the super high achievers, the alpha dogs, the go, go, goes, the super like third brain overload. My brain is, my mind is super smart. Their body's going, dude, what are you doing? This is yeah. dead or I'm broken and you, and I'm going to get your attention because I'm yeah. really, I'm running the show. Here. Yeah. I've known people who were running that pattern and then literally had a stroke yeah. and like had a, a, a near death experience where they, their body was basically like, listen to me. Right. Your body, <laughs> your, your body does not lie. That's why you see people. It's like, yeah. okay, they talk this game, but like your body's, you know, yeah. I had this wonderful, amazing teacher. He had such an effect on my uh, massage life, my personal training life, my holistic view of the body. Genius in so many ways. Telling people, oh, teaching people to detox. Oh, you need to detox. Oh, your blood. And there's all these things you got to do. He knows all of this shit. But he's got a gut the size of a basketball, like a hard gut the size of a basketball. And he looks kind of fucked up. And you're like, mm. you know, yeah. it's like the body don't lie. And it's like, yeah. it, it's, it, it keeps the score. There's a good book called The Body Keeps the Score. And if you check that one out. Yeah, yeah. I have and, that on my the show. Body, the body does not lie. So yeah. I mean, that, by the way, somatic psychology, thank you for mentioning that. If you want to go down that road, Body Keeps the Score is an amazing place to start. Uh, the work of Peter Levine, he wrote a book called, um, uh, in an unspoken voice. Right. That's another excellent book. Oh. And then anything by Alexander yeah, Lowen. Yeah. 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 Is another place to start that, that stuff transformed my NLP and hypnosis work. It right. changed the way that I, the results that I could get with clients. And it also changed the way that hypnosis and NLP worked for me in a really dramatic and significant way. Yeah. I, I am all about the feels and I hate to say yeah. it like that because it's such a millennial thing, but feelings and the thing, yeah. and the reason you are, the people are not the way they are is because they're usually afraid to feel or yeah. they can't imagine feeling a certain way. Yeah. Like I yeah. can't, like I can't imagine, but what if you could imagine feeling that way? Cause that's right. The key to motivation. We talk about all the time. It's like, imagine how you're going to feel when you're done. If that yeah. doesn't motivate you, what will uh, other than imagine how, it's going to feel to not get punished for not doing the thing that you're supposed to do. It's like, either way, it's feelings that are going to get that shit done. It's yeah. not NLP and going, well, what if this word, it's like the feelings are the yeah. thing. Feelings are things. Well, to, to slightly reframe the question, is there anything that hypnosis or NLP isn't good at helping at? One of the good. things is that, that, is that that's what, what the, that's the question is. Sentence verbatim. Is there anything that hypnosis or NLP isn't good at helping? Okay, because you put you said helping at, and I was like, did they oh. really say that? <laughs> that was <laughs> like, that was me. Uh, yeah, it's not good at helping at with dangling parts. That's what you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, another way to kind of look at that question is like, when it doesn't work, why doesn't it work? And right. a lot of times you talk about like the the hyper rational disconnected living in their head i would call it narcissistic but not in the way that most people think of that word uh and the problem is that when you sit down and do the work with those people they can sit there and visualize it and maybe they can visualize oh, it maybe they can't even do that think about it real hard that's for sure right right but if it doesn't get down into their yeah. feels yeah and it's if not you're gonna working do with anything. people and you see that it's the same with the sniffing things like if you're working with somebody and they're giving you all the right answers, but they're not, I mean, it doesn't take that much, uh, you know, sensory acuity to see that someone's just like in their head when they should be, oh, right, this feeling and all the good. It's like you should, as a coach, be able to see 
the results of your work as feelings that someone's having. And if they're not, yeah. then there's still work to do. Yeah. yeah. If not, they're just thinking real hard. And usually they've studied, they've even studied some NLP. Right. And I've read some books on hypnosis. I'm like, cool. Yeah. Then why are you calling me? Oh, right. Because <laughs> right. it's all that shit in your head. And yeah. once you can let the floodgates go, then all that information yeah. can fill your body, all those feelings. And notice what he just did there physically. Like he was oh, yeah. demonstrating what does it look like to break down the walls of disconnection from living in your head and right. open up the feeling and the connection to the rest of your body. In the hippie world, they often call it grounding is a way yeah. of like getting you into your body. Yeah, but yeah. that's why I taught a course once called Lose Your Mind. And right. the goal of that program is if, if you lose your mind, if you go out of your mind, where else is there to go? There's right. only a, one other place, in your body. Right. And your body is much, much, much smarter, wiser, and older than you. Yep, brain one, baby. Okay, on that note, I think that's good. We're good for this week. Sweet. All yeah, right. Man. Thanks, folks. All right. Uh, well, post your questions down below if you're listening and, and you have things. We'd love to start uh, continuing a dialogue or creating a dialogue here with the people who are watching this. Uh, I saw that some of our previous podcasts just on Facebook alone have a couple hundred views. So whoever's watching those, uh, comment, send us messages. Let us know what's going tell on. Tell me how great I am. Tell me how Comment, great. like, share, subscribe, all that shit. Too. All that stuff. God. yes uh okay well thank you for watching thank you for talking and, uh, peace love and nlp hey, everybody <laughs>